zero number of people have come up to me and asked me to make a video basically reviewing my own albums over the year. And I, this, uh, this video is obviously not a review. First of all, I feel like if I were to slap a score onto my own projects, that would imply that I think it's up to me to decide whether I'm better than other artists. No. <laughs> my opinion on my own music doesn't matter. No one will be able to get my perspective on it just by listening to it, because they are not the ones who made it. And on top of that, it's impossible for me to step back and look at my own albums with fresh eyes. Not just because I'm the one who made them, obviously that's a big part of it, but also because I listen to them all the time. I, I guarantee you no one has listened to more 256Pi than 256Pi. That's how I decide whether or not my stuff is any good or worth putting out in the world and promoting and plugging like this. I feel like if it turns out that something I make ends up not being enjoyed by anyone else, everyone else thinks it's crap, I ought to at least be able to enjoy my, my own stuff myself. And I think that should go for all artists. Their music should please themselves first and foremost. Otherwise, I gotta imagine making music would just become a total chore and stop being fun in the first place. But point is, I would feel even more insufferably pretentious than I already do right now if I were to try and cover this the same way as everything else. But I do have solidified thoughts on my own albums. I have plenty to say on them, things I like and don't like about each of them. So I decided may as well just have this video where I, you know, ramble about my honest thoughts on my own stuff. So, yeah. So at one point in 2016, I had 12 releases on Bandcamp and 10 of them were considered albums at the time. And I decided, okay, at I would, I'm, as a music reviewer with a regular video segment where I go down an artist's entire discography so far in brief, I know I don't like looking up at, you know, massively prolific back catalogs and sitting through artists with that many releases. None of mine were precisely short, they were all about an hour each. And not all of them were precisely essential listening, either. I can't imagine anyone looking up at something like Abstract Concept and thinking, Oh yeah, that's the best this dude has to offer. And that's why at the time I decided to separate all my releases out as albums and compilations. With just the one that I thought were my best, or the most important to me marked as main albums, and the ones I deemed less essential as my compilations. And even though this technically wasn't the earliest set of tracks I had, period, I picked this as my official debut album. As for why, well, uh, a few reasons, but uh, the main one is that it's the earliest selection of tracks that I have that I can listen to without internally cringing in some way. I have a hard time listening to tracks that utilize GarageBand loops now since, I mean, anyone with a Mac can use those. That makes something like One Tint kinda hard to listen to. Sure, it's excusable, as I made all of that stuff before I was even in middle school, but it is the only stuff from that period that I find even remotely listenable. The whole thing is almost a joke to me now. But Acid Loops don't give me that reaction. I feel like they've been a lot more integrated into my style, I guess. By that I mean there's a sound to them that doesn't feel like it's directly ripping off other artists, but it isn't transparently amateurish. So I can listen to my own music and feel like, oh, this this sounds like 256Pi, and that's it. Not to mention, this particular selection of tracks just has a special place in my heart that I've been so used to the arrangement of over the course of this past decade. See, the original version of Bubble Machine actually was put together on July 13th, 2008. Like, the dates I- the release dates I gave to Dark Clouds and Marble Jar are just, you know, kind of arbitrary. They just meant to show the year I made the music in, and not the year that I put them together. But I know the date for Bubble Machine because I actually did put those together in 2008. It wasn't called Bubble Machine back then, but uh, I didn't change anything about the arrangements or any part of the setup of that album when I first discovered Bandcamp and was setting up my page for the first time. It's kind of a classic in my little brain as a reminder of my middle school days, which I still can't help but look upon fondly. And it felt like the beginning of what became my usual method of making uh, my music as the years went by. Now, of course, there is still the unavoidable fact that when I made this album, I was only 12. I was in sixth grade. And, uh, I think it kind of shows. 
I mean, I was this starry-eyed Orbital fan who wanted to make music just like them, and I had extremely limited tools to accomplish that. For instance, I imagined the first track, Alfalfa, as like some grand, epic, large-scale thing inspired by the two-parter pieces from Insides. And uh, even though I wasn't able to pass the 10 minute mark without making it boring or not feel like one track anymore, the fact that I got it up to 9 minutes was such a mark of pride for me at the time. Alfalfa was originally a two-parter as well, but the two parts sound almost exactly the same, so I, I just stuck them together and presented it all as one track from then on. But whatever. Uh, Yes, I was trying to make my tracks longer. I think I did have the right instinct at the time not to make loops just stretch on way too many times and make that because that would make tracks really boring to listen to. But I will not deny there is still uh, artificial padding all over this, <laughs> especially the original version. Like Alfalfa isn't really nine minutes and ten seconds. It's just a little short of nine minutes and has just a, this big long 10 second silence tacked on at the end. Archie's in the car and volume have little tacked on outros that where, where just a bunch of loops come in and blend together all at once. I mean, it's just silly little tricks like that to make my stuff look more impressive than it actually was. Because I felt like since orbital tracks were always really long, making my tracks longer made me more like them. I guess. I don't feel like it's so distractingly padded out to the point of intolerability or just being straight boring, but I know that was my mindset at the time. When you really get down to it, Bubble Machine really only makes sense as a collection of tracks from a 12-year-old Orbital fan making stuff up as he went along. Maybe I'd have an idea for just in my head for something cool, but it wouldn't come all that close to it. Like, Silent But Smelly had this rough and gritty but almost kooky vibe that brought Wario to my mind. But there's these two out of nowhere side tracks that don't have much to do with anything, and they're just there because they sound cool. Or Food Processor and Moving Nonstop. Those, believe it or not, were inspired by Croftworks Electric Cafe, of all things. I mean, they don't sound even remotely close. Food Processor is like this vaguely 70s flavored instrumental hip hop thing, and Moving Nonstop is like some weird dark ambient techno thing and neither of them even remotely resemble Croftwork at all. But I know that I had initially conceived them as part of a three-part suite, kind of like a boing boom shock techno pop and music non-stop, hence moving non-stop. And there was a third part of this suite called Irrelevant, but since that particular track really sucks, I didn't keep it around. Food Processor, I remember, was titled as such because not only was it rid a ridiculous title like boing boom shock, it was a machine. That's a double Kraftwerk nod that nobody would have been able to pick up on in a million years if I hadn't just explained it to you right now. Now, despite all that, acid loops do sometimes give me the kind of tools that I would need to pull off an idea that I had. Like Alone in the Wild was made as a soundtrack to one of my dad's videos talking about the 100-year Merkel's curse that fell over the Chicago Cubs, rendering them unable to win another World Series after 1908. Well, more specifically, it was something I made up on the fly out of context to sound all spooky, and my dad thought it was perfect for the video and he heard it, so it made it onto this album, thanks to the whatever amount of attention it got. And it just so happens to really transition well out of Silent But Smelly, so that works too. <laughs> Archie's in the Car was named after my uncle's dog. I think I heard he wanted to, like, make a video that didn't end up happening about him playing with his dog in the park, and he wanted a soundtrack for that. And also, I think my dad wanted me to make a track in which I didn't have as much weird electronic stuff, as he called it. So that was the end result. And to this day, I think it's the only track of mine that my dad actually knows. <laughs> uh, even though I've showed him my other stuff plenty of times over the years. Electronic music is not his thing. But whatever, now anyways, as much nostalgia as I have for the time in which the material from this album was made, I thought there was the potential for an even better project if I could remedy some of its overwhelming sixth graderness. And that was basically what uh, Bubble Machine Remastered set out to accomplish in 2016. I basically just rebuilt the whole album from scratch as someone with actual experience in music production and mixing, and uh, made it into a continuous mix. I've always felt like making an album's tracks flow into each other is a good way to make any album feel more like everything belongs together as a whole in basically any setting. 
and I think it flowed surprisingly really well in this format. Since most of the tracks were about the same tempo, it all just fell into place naturally. And also really turned Alfalfa into the kind of track I had originally envisioned it being like. Like there was a melody in there I remembered humming during gym class when mapping out the track in my mind at the time. And I could still remember how that melody went, so I put it in the intro of this version. And I generally made it even more orbital-y than it already was, with stronger build-ups and payoffs made it even more epic an experience than it was before. Seeing this 12-minute new version of Alfalfa that even flowed pretty naturally would have made the 12-year-old me so proud. Now, of course, there's no way for me to completely remove the presence of a 6th grader's vision in the album, because the ideas behind the tracks and how they're laid out is still really goofy. There's still silly moments on every track, like 1, 2, 3, or on the MIC on volume, that in retrospect that comes completely out of left field. And Picture Autosave Render's file has never been the most satisfying ending for me, like, and that one flute riff in the first half is not does not sound good. But I can't bring myself to change it at this point, since it's too embedded into my life. Like I said, this kind of stuff is more aimed towards pleasing myself than it is for with a wider audience, but whatever. Regardless, I do feel like the remastered version is a much more listenable experience than the original. I would much rather go around promoting that one. I feel like Bubble Machine is the kind of album that at least knows what it is and isn't trying to, you know, reach for the stars. Just the title and album artwork lets you know you're in for a bit of a goofy and immature experience masterminded by a sixth grader. I think Bubble Machine's a surprisingly really, really well-fitting title for it, too, with the bubble parts coming from the fact that it's generally a pretty light-hearted experience and not remotely serious, but the machine part could come from its adherence to that Orbital Green album structure and sticking to its dance beats. Not to mention the strange abundance of darker ambient techno moments. A dichotomy especially highlighted in something like Fly Birdie Fly, which had both the lighthearted and carefree moments like with that one flute riff, but also those darker moments like with the intro and that section that reprises it near the end. And what's funny is that I didn't even have any of that stuff in mind when I came up with the title. I just happened to have a bunch of like just perfectly square pictures I made when messing around with effects in a photo editor that just happened to make really good album covers. And this got picked for this particular album by pure coincidence. It just so happens to be really fitting, at least for me. As for what other people are gonna think, uh, I don't know. I know this album is not everyone's cup of tea. I actually had someone give me a written review of this album once, which I thought was pretty cool. And I remember that they thought this album was basically unlistenable all the way through. Everything was way too repetitive, the flute riffs were annoying, it was just an awkward and unfulfilling slog. Like, a 4 out of 10. I seem to also recall that person saying they didn't listen to much dance music in general. And I remember thinking at the time, oh come on, there's more repetitive artists out there than me, good luck out, good luck getting into Underworld or Plastic Man. But that guy's opinion was perfectly valid, I mean, there's only so much I can defend an album carrying out the vision of a 12-year-old. If a lot of people do end up hating this one, I mean, that is perfectly understandable. I would honestly be a lot more shocked if someone were to say that they thought it was an amazing, like, 9 out of 10 album, or even higher. Even I don't think I would rank it that highly myself, but... At the end of the day, I do really like this album. I think it's... I think that's most important. It's just a nostalgic little experience that's good for a bunch of random fun. Silly little dance album that doesn't take itself too seriously, but I hope is at least catchy and leaves an impact. I hope other people were able to get some fun out of it as well. Mm -hmm.